At first, this homicide in the Ukrainian city of Dnipropetrovsk was thought to be a result of a routine boozy brawl. Horrendous events of World War II brutalized the people. Conflicts involving stabbings were not something extraordinary. The victim had been quite an inconspicuous man, fireman Pavel Grebenyuk. The dead body was found by a local grocery porter. He rushed out of the building in horror and bumped into a woman living next door. Together they went down into the boiler room. The detectives arrived in no time and demanding a full account from the first witnesses. What exactly did they do near the boiler room? The woman explained that she was on her way to get some hot water. The building used central steam heating, but hot water supply was disconnected. For a small tip, Grebenuk let people fill their buckets. He might even allow tenants to take a quick wash right in the boiler room, where a shower behind a screen was conveniently installed. A stock room porter explained that he would normally drop by the firemen a few times a day. They would smoke together, discussing latest news. That morning, on the 21st of November, all went on as usual. He placed all the veggies on the shelves and went to see the fellow. He was quite surprised to see the door open, but the steam from the boiler wasn't going up as it normally did. The boiler was indeed cold, which meant that the fireman had been dead by the morning. The post-mortem lividity led to conclude that death occurred some 12-14 hours ago, that is last evening. The wound left no doubt that the man was stepped in his chest with a piercing and cutting tool, most likely with a knife. The killing weapon, however, was not found by the body. Instead, bloody footprints left by the man's shoes of two different sizes were easily detected on the floor. One pair of the footprints most certainly belonged to the porter. The man explained that upon seeing a dead body, he panicked and could have unconsciously stepped into the pool of blood. Whose were the other footprints? Detectives noticed a table with sandpaper on it in the corner of the room. It turned out that the fireman's additional side income came from sharpening knives, scissors and blades. To avoid confusions, he wrapped these items in sandpaper, writing the customer's name on it. Detectives noted that one sheet of sandpaper with the written name Bonanchuk did not have a knife inside. Obviously, it could be just an accidental occurrence, but a chance that Grebenuk was killed with a missing knife was high. There was yet another finding that led to believe that it was not just a routine domestic homicide. A criminologist found a niche in the wall. Brick crumbs and dust indicated that this hiding place could have been opened recently. If it was, robbery as a motive for the murder had to be looked into. The lady knew little about the murdered fireman. He lived a lonely life, had neither friends nor enemies. In the summer, when there was no work at the boiler room, he almost never left his apartment right in this building. A local street cleaner couldn't offer any additional information either. She kept wailing about the curse over the building and the evil spirit that used to visit her under a disguise of a scar-faced man. She added that it was an envoy from the spirit of the original owner of the building, Merchant Yanovsky, killed by the Bolsheviks. The detective tried to figure out the connection between the merchant shot in 1919 and the fireman's death. The demanding street cleaner explained that the dead Yanovsky was annoyed with how his building was remodeled and with the huge number of tenants settled down in the house without his permission. The mass relocation of rural citizens into cities after the revolution and wars triggered a genuine residential crisis. Compaction, a horrible word feared by all cities' residents. A special tenants board was in charge of determining the number of residents per an apartment. Square meterage per one person kept shrinking, new partitions were being installed but it was still not enough to meet the ever-growing demand for housing. After the 1917 revolution people were unable to pay rent, no account of tenants was being maintained while the financial system essentially collapsed. The situation was completely uncontrolled and unregulated. People could not resist new tenants being put up in their apartments. The most boorish newcomers could arbitrarily oust original residents. What used to be fancy buildings turned into ugly and outrageously designed hen houses. The street cleaner kept on ranting about the merchant's son Misha, about his falling off the bicycle and injuring his face. The only thing that helped shut up the batty old woman was the arrival of a young woman Larissa living in the next building. The neighbor recalled that the day before the young lady had a quarrel with the victim. She ran out of the boiler room with empty buckets yelling that she would complain to her boyfriend. 
The only thing known about the boyfriend was his name Valeri and that recently he walked out of prison. Larissa's last name is Bananchuk, exactly the name written on the sandpaper with a knife in. Could it be that the guy with a criminal record killed the fireman? Larissa's reception of the detectives was quite hostile. She declined to say where her boyfriend was but admitted her fight with the fireman. She told that he had allowed her to take shower, but when she started to undress, she noticed him snoop on her. The young woman yelled at Grebenuk and ran out of the boiler room, leaving behind the knife she had asked the fireman to sharpen. Coming home, she shared the incident with her boyfriend. He took it with humor but promised to take care of the offender and to pick up the forgotten knife. But he never came back after leaving. The detectives had no doubts that the woman considers her boyfriend to be a murderer and pressed on her demanding that she disclose the man's home address. Pavel Grebenuk found slain at his workplace. The weapon of the murder was not found, but it is supposed to be the knife which the young housewife asked to sharpen. The suspicion falls on a young woman's boyfriend, Valeri, who supposedly went to the fireman to stick up for his girlfriend. Valeri was found asleep. Suffering from heavy hangover, he couldn't grasp at once what the detectives wanted. A knife missing from the boiler room was found in his pants pocket, his shoes stained with dried blood. The examination proved that the footprints in the boiler room belonged to Valeri, and blood on his shoes matched the blood group of the victim. However, not the smallest trace of blood was found on the knife. The probe showed that uh, Valeri Minkov had served time for robbery, using cold weapon. The ex-con swore, however, that he never killed anyone. He just came to the boiler room to smack in the fireman's face, but found a dead body lying on the floor. He realized that blowing the whistle would turn a disaster for him. No one would believe he was innocent. All he did was grabbing the knife and running away. Returning to his girlfriend seemed a bad idea, so he came home and got drunk. Valeria's testimony was hard to buy. He was detained as a suspect. Forensic examination, however, sustained Valeri's confession. The shape of the blade did not coincide with the victim's wound edges. The fireman was clearly killed with another knife. Plus, the motive for the murder looked quite doubtful. Is snooping on the girl a good enough reason to kill? There was yet another mystery that needed to be cracked, the hiding place. The most scrupulous examination detected no traces of brick dust on Valeri's clothes. Suddenly, detectives got a call from Yakov Schwartz, an antique dealer famous in Dnepropetrovsk. He showed uh, detectives five golden coins minted before the revolution. Two things raised the dealer's suspicion. First, the people normally don't sell gold in such quantities. Second, these coins could not belong to the seller, who looked like a real tow wreck. The cunning antiquarian made a conversation with the customer who confessed that he had more to offer. Following the procedure, Schwartz asked for the customer's ID to pay him and recorded his personal data. The coin seller's was VP Cherenichenko. It was the name of the stock reporter. The man was found at his workplace. He did not deny selling the coins, but explained that he inherited them from his grandpa, a World War I vet. The reason for selling the coins was the need to cover the friend's funeral expenses. The explanation sounded rather questionable, and detectives decided to search the man's residence. What they found was another 17 golden coins, a genuine fortune. Another precious find was a knife with handles of which the microscopic particles of dried blood. The group on reasons of the blood matched the victim's blood. The crime picture was gradually emerging. While drinking together, the firemen showed the pal a hiding place with golden coins. The porter killed him and grabbed the treasure. In the morning, he staged the finding of the dead body. However, the porter fervently denied that his friend showed him the hiding. It was somebody else who enticed the crime. Fireman Grebenuk was found dead. During the crime scene examination, an empty hiding place is found in the brick wall. Soon afterwards, detectives learn about golden coins sold to an antiquarian. The seller is the victim's friend, a stockroom porter at a local grocery. He confesses of the murder, but says that it was a weird stranger who tempted him into the crime. The porter testified that two weeks earlier he ran into a man in the boiler room who he had never seen before. 
The man introduced himself as Fyodor and asked if he could take shower. He offered five rubles for it, though even one ruble would have been enough. The fellows realized that Fyodor is a strange to the place and not a simple man. He treated new pals to some booze and told he was a geodesist examining old buildings. He cracked funny jokes about hidden treasures. The fireman said he didn't care about treasures. He said he was happy with his life, but the porter disagreed. He'd love to find treasure to buy himself a new house and to get married. A few days later, Fyodor showed up again and told the porter that there is a treasure in the boiler room. He offered to sedate the fireman to search for golden coins. In case of fire Finding them, he promised to concede one third of the loot. So they did. While the fireman was asleep after the sedative added to his vodka, Fyodor easily found the hiding place and recovered 70 coins, giving the porter 20 of them, but the man demanded another three to make a fair share. Fyodor agreed, paid three more and left. The porter grabbed the trophy and ran home. As he hid it, he saw that his share was short of one coin. Given the value of the whole loot, it was nothing, but the fireman could find the missing coin when he'd wake up. There was no choice to going back to the boiler room. The fireman was already awake, sitting at the table and examining the lost coin. He replayed the conversation and realized that he was outfoxed. His companions found the treasure and split it without him. The fireman demanded the treasure back, otherwise he threatened to turn the fellows into authorities. The porter understood that his dreams are about to evaporate and it is only the murder that can save him. He promised to deliver the gold. In the evening he came with a knife. When everything was over, he retrieved the last coin. The detectives needed the description of the mysterious Fyodor, realizing that the name was most likely made up. The porter said he was about 60 years old and remembered a scar on his face. A scar-faced man was mentioned by the nutty cleaner on the first day of the investigation. She also brought up the name of Mikhail, the son of Merchant Yanovsky. The detectives had no doubts. Fyodor's real name was Mikhail Yanovsky, and he was the only one who knew where his father had hidden golden coins. A detailed description of the suspect was circulated across the board. Soon enough, an officer at Dnepropetrovsk terminal detained a man matching the description. Yanovsky didn't resist the detention. In his personal belongings, three golden coins were found. Asked about the rest of the gold, he declined to answer. He was impressively open at interrogations, confessing that his life ended up completely derailed. In fact, he didn't want too much from his life. To work in his father's shop, smelling the odors of olive oil, sweets and freshly baked bread. To get married and to have kids. Instead, he had to face the death of someone very dear and what's more, to renounce him. He knew about the treasure since childhood, but only dared to retrieve it when his age made it impossible to put the dream off. Mikhail learned about the fireman's death when rumors started to spread around the city. He never meant to kill anyone, it was only the porter's greed that led to murder. For the committed murder, Cherednichenko was sentenced to 12 years behind bars. He served the time in full and upon walking out, he got a job of a porter at the same grocery store. Mikhail Yanovsky's punishment was just ludicrous. One month of imprisonment. Upon release, however, he most likely failed to find the hidden coins.